Adapters, welcome back. We have an exciting episode for you. Our guest is Dr. A.R. Siders. A.R. is an assistant professor in the Biden School of Public Policy and Administration, Geography and Spatial Sciences and Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware. She studies climate change adaptation with a focus on equity and managed retreat. She holds a JD from Harvard and a PhD from Stanford. A.R. will stress how we adapt how adapting is a social justice issue. She provides her insights into managed retreat and explores the various ways it can occur. Air will emphasize the importance of immediate managed retreat planning and shares how communities can decide where managed retreat can take place. Hey there, AR. Welcome to the show. Hey, Doug. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for having these conversations. Well, you and I have chatted about managed retreat before, and it's always a pleasure to, to have you on. And, you know, I, I guess... You know, how did you get into managed retreat? You know, what your background and such, but how did how did you get into this field? Uh, so I got into managed retreat because I was living in New York City during Hurricane Sandy, and I was working at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia. And I'd actually just started in September, and we were trying to figure out what kind of adaptation work I'd be doing. And then Sandy hit in October, so it was perfect timing from a making it clear what I was going to do with the next year of my life. <laughs> so I worked on post Sandy recovery and there were all of these conversations about where do we rebuild and how do we rebuild, or sorry, all these conversations about when we rebuild and how we rebuild and not conversations about where we rebuild or about should we rebuild, right? And so starting talking to these local officials who would say, oh, we can't do managed retreat. That's not, that's not American or that's not legal or that's not something we do here. Uh, and I knew that we had decades of experience doing this. And so that started me on this path of, why do we think this, right? Why do people think that this is new? Why do they think that this is, why is it so problematic, right? Um, and so yeah, that just really got me intrigued about how we think about these kinds of policies and how we can use them more effectively. Sandy was a catalyst, I think, for a lot of these conversations, but the, the, actually even the terminology of managed retreat, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot. Do you, do you know where that started? I mean, we're, we're... I don't know the origins of it. So um, I know several people have looked at this. It's been around for several decades at least. Um, I mean, back, you know, at least into the mid 1900s. Um, it seems to be used in some ecology work and also in engineering. So we talk about moving buildings or you talk about ecosystems that are sort of moving away from coastal issues or other hazards. Uh, but I don't know where the term started and I wish I did. I bet that there's probably some military origins to the use too, you know, and there's technical way of just saying how we're moving people and such. Okay, so why are we talking about it now? You, t you mentioned Sandy and that's how you got involved with it, but this, a lot of people might think of it as a future issue. Well, okay, we might need to move from the coast, but it, you would argue it's a today issue. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely a conversation we need to be having now, if not a decade ago. Uh, and there's two real reasons. The first is that we're experiencing harms now. Right, we have massive wildfires. We've got heat waves. We've got floods. We've, I mean, we've had a record-breaking number of hurricanes making landfall, and there's a lot of people who are being hurt by those and who want out. They don't want to live through the next hurricane season. They don't want to rebuild for the fifteenth time. They don't want to go through this. Their kids don't want to go through this. They want out, and so we need a plan to help them get out, and to help them get out in a way that doesn't just put new families in the same risk. Right? If we just let them sell on the regular real estate market, they're just putting a new family at risk. And so it doesn't actually reduce the problem. So that's what we need to talk about now. And the other reason is that managed retreat at scale is really difficult for learning uh, and doing it well is really difficult. We've been doing retreat, well, uh, some people will point out, I'm sure in the comment section that humans have been retreating since we became human. Um, but you know, as a country and formally, we've been doing it for at least several decades and we're still just figuring out how to do it really well. So if we can look ahead and say, hey, by 2100 or 2070, we may need to relocate small towns or whole communities. We might need until 2070 to figure out how to do that well. Um, you know, everything we do, putting seawalls in, putting beach nourishment down, it buys us time. And the question is, what is it buying us time for? And I think it's buying us time to figure out how to do managed retreat well. So, but that, only, that buying us that time is only good if we use that time. So great, we've got a couple of decades, we you know, built the seawall up higher, we've got time, now we need to use it to figure out how to do this well before we scale it up. Well, I wanna come back to that notion of scale, but I think of maybe just some test runs and you th think of flooding events along rivers and like the National Flooding Insurance Program, the, the term for it, it's been in some ways a big failure. You know, People keep going back and they, they rebuild in the same areas. And it, if that 
program was functioning properly. And I think there has been some reforms to really try to encourage it, but manage to retreat away from these these rivers. And what what's your sense there? Are, are they making any progress? Uh, so, no. The okay. Government Accountability Office came out with a report actually just this summer. Um, well, I'm, now I'm forgetting whether it's July or September report, but they came out with a report that basically says uh, the National Flood Insurance Program hasn't been mitigating as many houses as it should. We haven't been buying up as many houses as we should. Uh, so they point out that the number of repetitive flood loss properties, so properties that flood and rebuild and flood and rebuild, right, those properties, we've added 60,000 properties like that. And over that same time period, we've only mitigated the damage, whether through buying them out or elevating them or flood proofing them, we've only mitigated 15,000 houses. So that's an additional 45,000 more repetitive loss properties. But that's more than the ones we've helped, right? So that means we're putting more people at risk than we're helping people who are already at risk. So no, the problem isn't working. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the system isn't working, the problem's getting bigger. And this is, this is one of the reasons I think we have to talk about manager treat as a more as, as a bigger scale and as, as a bigger project, right? Is it's not enough to just say pick off one house here or there. We need to be thinking about this more systematically. And not only how do we move those houses out of the floodplain, but how do we prevent the next 60,000 houses from being added to the floodplain in the first place? I have a bias towards sea level rise and coastal managed retreat. And I think you've uh, it's an area I think you focused on quite a bit too. And you know ugh. Where are we at in that respect? Uh, would the scale be at the town level, the neighborhood level, or would it be at sort of like, there's ways I guess you could have, you know, communities just unravel slowly in a somewhat organized way. And then there's economic considerations. There's climate, and I'm climate justice for sure want to touch upon, but do you have sort of an ideal kind of managed retreat for a certain size city that people can kind of get their heads around the issue with? So, uh, so I like to dream big, right? Please, <laughs> right? So, so when I think about managed retreat, I think about New York City relocating, okay? Uh, and and I don't say this jokingly, right? I mean, New York City. What if over the next hundred years, right? Since think about what New York City looked like in 1900, very different, right? Horses and carts, not cars, no big. So, what it looked like in 1900, and how different it's going to if it looks that different from 1900. To today, it's going to look similarly different from today to 2120, right, in the next hundred years. So what if we spent that hundred years not just building walls to keep it the way it is, but to slowly invest in new infrastructure up in Westchester? What if we relocated the airport to north of the city and we started expanding subway lines out that way? What if we encouraged businesses to put their headquarters not in lower Manhattan where it floods, but up in the Bronx where it's on higher ground? And what if we did it in a way that didn't gentrify and displace all of those neighborhoods, right? What if we did it in a way that created more equitable distribution of resources and access to things? So when I think about retreat, that's what I actually think about is like, how could we move New York City three miles north and do it over the next century in a way that helped everyone in the city, not just wealthy businesses or property owners. Um, you know, so, obviously most people in the United States don't live in New York City, but, but I think we have to start thinking big scale like that. So in that scenario, when you're talking about, oh, let's move the airport and such, what happens to the old areas? Because it, you rarely are gonna get a situation where it's completely abandoned. And then you've got that friction of like, well, what's staying? I mean, but in your, your thinking big scenario, what, what happens to those areas? Yeah, so a lot of places around the coast, I mean, to pick on New York, uh, and I don't mean to be picking on New York, New Yorkers who are watching this, uh, but to pick on New York, a lot of those areas were originally wetland. So can we return them to being wetland, right? Wetland absorbs a lot of floodwaters. It helps with storm systems. It provides a lot of ecosystem benefits, you know, outside of that. Can we return them? Can we restore them? Can we do something with that space? Uh, and if we can't restore them to wetlands, can we do them in a, done something with that land that then benefits the community? So the idea is not to have just an abandoned airport sitting there becoming derelict, right? But hey, can we use all this large flat space for recreational facilities for a new central park? Can we do something beneficial with that land? Uh, I mean, even a big city park with grass on it would absorb more flood water than a concrete runway, right? Can we do something with that? 
Well, have you done that? And I would, have you, you know, you've, you've probably been involved with scenario planning of various sorts. You know, it's like, oh, you, you deal with the parks organizations. Like, let's, you know, let's create a map of the city where all these parks are. And you, you, you can sort of do that with what you're describing. But a scenario plan process would allow people to kind of visualize. Have you done that yet with like your students or with communities or anything? So we do this occasionally in class uh, more as a thought exercise, right? What could it look like? Um, usually we don't do this with New York. We'll do it with like Delaware, right? What could we do in Delaware? If we relocated populations, what would it look like? Where would people have to go? Um, but there are so many pieces involved in this that it would really, to do this well, would require a very big team. And that would require so much actual community engagement, right? Because you don't want me just sitting down and saying, here's the vision for New York, let's go, right? You want New Yorkers to come together and say, this is our vision of where we want New York to go. Uh, and similarly with Delawareans, right? Um, so you need a huge team because you need to be thinking not just about where does the airport go, but how do all the transportation hubs connect to that? And where does the affordable housing go? And what do the city parks look like? You'd need so many people to be involved. Uh, but I also think that it's the, the reason I like thinking big like this is I think if you had a vision that was bold enough, it could get all those people excited to get involved. Yeah, in a way that saying, let's build a levy, I don't know, it's not quite as exciting and it doesn't get as many people thinking, oh, I have a role in that, I can get engaged. The way, hey, let's totally reimagine what it would mean to live in a city like this or what it would mean to live in a coastal state. That can get people excited. And there's probably 15 people, well, more than that, that I would you know, have in my dream team that I don't even know that I would want them on my dream team, mm. right? They'd have to come to me and say, hey, I have something to add. I'd be like, yes, that's an amazing contribution. What about the U.S. military? And you think of communities like Norfolk that we, we I get the sense they're taking it seriously, but you're never quite sure. And they're probably mapping out potential like managed retreat. Do, are, are you talking with military folks and are they really serious about it? So uh, actually the Navy, so I, I was a presidential management fellow at the U.S. Navy. Um, I got to work very briefly on the task force climate change uh, under at that point where Admiral Titley. And it was really interesting to see how seriously they were taking climate change and the fact that, you know, all of their assets are on the coast and at risk of sea level rise and flooding. What are they going to do about that? I think it's really difficult for them because they, on the one hand, they have total control over their infrastructure and they could, you know, redesign anything on the base. On the other hand, they have just like any city or business organization, right? They've got a million competing demands for all those funds, limited resources. And they're trying very hard, uh, at least I get the impression they're trying very hard to be good neighbors to their community. So they can't just pick up and move a base because of all the implications that would have for everybody else around that neighborhood. So I know that they're working on it, but it's one of those, this is, it goes back to why we need to talk about it now. These issues are so complicated and so integrated that it's gonna take time. So I think they are working on it, but like anything else, it looks slow because they're trying to take it seriously and think about all the complications that are involved. You know, I don't want to interrupt, but we could edit this too, but the sun is shining on you very, do you, is there a curtain you can pull down real quick? Yeah, just one second. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll edit this, don't worry. I just, I want to get you in better light. And perfect, much better. It was yeah. just, blinding you on one side let's just jump right <laughs> and now we can see no, your sorry. star star wars poster behind you too so that's all, all oh, good excellent good um so show off my nerdy. <laughs> Let, let's talk about some of that i want to i like talking about the mundane issues around managed retreat too and you think of the infrastructure that's left behind and to me it's just it's we have future Superfund sites just waiting for us even being a gas station is going to be a super fun site well, what What's, I guess, everything around when you think about infrastructure that you have to leave? What are those the issues that we have to consider? This is a really great question, and I wish I had more details for you. Um, so in the U.S., most retreat happens through buyout programs, and those buyout programs will not move places unless they are environmentally clean. So they have an environmental site inspection, and they can only move if they are given a clean bill of health, or I don't know, yeah, <laughs> a clean environmental inspection. So... We don't have a lot of experience with this, with figuring out what do you do about those contaminated sites other than clean them up and deal with them like super fun sites, which means I think we're going to have to invest a lot more money and a lot more energy in cleaning those places up. 
um, even our existing Superfund sites, many of them are in flood plains, uh, right? they're subject to flooding, which can spread the contamination and cause other problems. And we haven't prioritized cleaning even our existing ones. So it's a huge problem. How do we think about the next places? Um, some of the issues that come up are, do we move the house or do we demolish it? Right? right now, the primary answer is we demolish the house, often because after a disaster, it's already halfway destroyed. So, right, of course, you just demolish it. But then, yeah, what do you do with all that debris? Um, there's some great buyout programs uh, where people are, instead of demolishing it, they're going in and they're hiring local contractors to go in and deconstruct the house so they can reuse components of it. Hmm. So as much of the house as you can reuse, let's do that, right? Take all those components. Rather than having a bulldozer come in, let's take it apart by hand. It's more time consuming, it's more expensive, but it's also a lot better for the local economy, for the people who are working there and for the environmental outcome. So there's things like that that we can do, we can deconstruct. There's a movement right now about how we can, uh, can we relocate homes? So relocating homes is incredibly difficult, especially in urban or even suburban areas. I mean, think about picking up a house and moving it. Think about every electrical wire across the street, right? That you have to turn it, try and fit a house under, or you have to deconnect and reconnect all the complications that come with that. Uh, going under any bridges, right? Doesn't happen. So just seemingly really mundane issues like that, like let's move this house, sounds great, actually really complicated. But there's a movement to how can we move these houses so we reuse more of these buildings that we already have, because that would help minimize our impact. Then of course you have uh, the septic systems that are attached to any house. So removing those out of the floodplain can actually be an environmental benefit. <laughs> you think about it like not having a bunch of septic systems in the flood water can be a help. But again, time consuming, expensive to take them all out and let that land rehabilitate. And who wants to pay for that? Like if local governments feel like their community's unraveling, people are moving away and just like, wait, you want us to go and spend money to take out all the septic systems too? Yeah, go jump in a lake. I mean, it's not gonna be, it's gonna be a federal response if you, if you have to do it. I think it's going to have to be federal or state, partly because when we think about this over time, um, right now, the federal government will pay Usually, most programs are up to 75%. Uh, there's exceptions, but mostly it's up to 75%. So if you think about a local community who has to pay 25% or even 12.5% if the state's matching, the more homes that they buy out, the more homes that they lose, the less property tax revenue they have as a town. So the harder it becomes for them to come up with that 12%. So the less likely they are to do more managed retreat. So it's almost like the first buyouts will be in some ways both the hardest because we won't know how, but the easiest because we'll have the most money in those places. The smaller those towns become, the harder it'll be for them to do this. And I think the states and feds are gonna to have to step in to help with that. And that raises another question of how can they do that productively? There's also all kinds of questions about as towns shrink, can they merge, right? Can we have takeovers of large cities taking over smaller cities to expand more room for development? Um, you know, there's going to be all kinds of interesting questions about, and, and no small town wants to do that, right? No small right. town wants to give up. Uh, I mean, my hometown had a huge fight just over renaming two high schools that were still going to be where they were, right? Like, how do we merge them and who gets what name and how do we maintain it? It's a huge issue. So, you know, merging two towns also is going to be a huge issue, but we might also have to move in that direction if we end up with these tiny towns that don't have enough population to really maintain their services. I got some questions coming in from the community room from Kayla and could we repurpose old infrastructure materials for the new construction? I think that's a great idea. Um, and I, this is an area where I wish I knew more about the, the actual construction industry, but we do see examples of this. So um, I was just speaking from, to someone from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So they have a program to actually do this kind of deconstruction so they can reuse as much as possible of the houses in new construction in new areas. And, and as a bigger, as a bigger comment, I should say that buyouts really need to be paired with comments about where the new housing is going to go, right? And that the fact that there needs to be new housing somewhere. Uh, we often talk about moving away from something, but we also need to talk about moving to something and what that right. looks like. Okay, here's a question from Ken. Um, is most of the projected cost of managed retreat go to coastal communities? Has anyone ever analyzed this from the perspective of transferring wealth from Midwest to the coast as taxpayers subsidize the cost of retreat? Yeah, so, so this is a really great question and one I'm very interested in. Um, working right now with some people at the University of Maryland to try to track disaster dollars and where they're spent. 
it's actually really difficult because of the number of agencies who are involved who are not FEMA. <laughs> right, we think about FEMA, but it's FEMA, it's HUD, it's US Army Corps, it's uh, agriculture, it's energy, it's Department of Schools, right? Every time they rebuild a school, they get money. So it's really difficult to track. Uh, with retreat specifically, the bulk of retreat actually is happening in either the Midwest, right along the Mississippi and a lot of rivers in the middle of the country, or along the coast. So we do see a lot of retreat on the coast, but we also see lots of retreat around rivers. And there's discussion that we might start seeing more retreat on the West Coast due to wildfires. Mm. It's not, we haven't seen it yet, but there's potential. So yes, there's concern that we might have some of this wealth transfer going on, but it's unlikely to happen through retreat. It's more likely to happen through repetitive building of repeated flood loss properties through the National Flood Insurance Program. Okay, here's a question from Brianna. When talking to people in flood zones, I often hear, where would you go that doesn't have some climate hazard? People reference the fires in California, tornadoes in the Midwest, etc. What is your response to that? Yeah, everywhere in our country, uh, someone did an analysis and there's only like a handful of counties in the US that haven't had a presidentially declared disaster. So everywhere's had something, but some places are more at risk than others, yeah? Even within the same county, uh, when we talk about managed retreat, I don't mean everyone should move to Iowa. Uh, I mean, everyone should move three miles inland. Okay? Some places it may have to be more than that, especially on the Gulf, you have these very flat areas. You may have to move 50 miles in or hundred. So you may be moving out of your county to the next county in. Um, and are you gonna be still at risk? Yes, but are you gonna be as at risk or at risk as frequently? No, there's no place on earth that you can live that you're not at risk. Flood risk mitigation, disaster risk mitigation isn't about no risk. It's about reducing risk to a level that people feel comfortable with. And everyone has their own point where they feel comfortable about this. And everyone has a different thing that they feel comfortable about. Doug, you and I were just talking about our temperature, right? I grew up in Minnesota. I would not feel comfortable in a 90 <laughs> degree day. That is not beautiful weather to me. That's too hot, right? Um, so you're more willing to risk overheating and I'm much more willing to, to risk getting hypothermia because we have different tolerances for that. Neither one's gonna be risk-free, it's just what we want to accept. So when I think about major retreat, it's not about having no risk, it's about moving to a place that has less risk and helping people move to a place where the level of risk that they're facing matches what they want to experience. All right, so we're getting toward the end of this episode. We're just scratching the surface on this. We're getting you back for sure. I, I, I got to get some more questions in the community. There's too much. All right, I, I, got, I want to ask you, we're going to go into just chatting for a little bit, and I got some more questions, but I wanted to get in a question that managed retreat, There, just by the name itself, means that there's some sort of coordination. There's some thinking and structure to it. And I just, I wonder, you think of, and I always think of Miami, and you've probably put a lot of thought into Miami too, is that, Oh well, they're doing it right. Look, they're they're discouraging new housing development. That's stage one, and there's just always the thinking about it. But then the whole notion of tipping points too, and it's just like the real estate values. And our friend Jesse Keenan, and I forgot to mention, Jesse wants us all to move to Duluth, right? We're all supposed yes. to go to Duluth. Um, That's my hometown, so yeah. <laughs> oh, really? I'm glad I wasn't knocking it yet. I'm not moving to Duluth. I'm sorry. Um, but Jesse has been doing some research about. Fluctuations in the real estate market down there, and mm -hmm. this is what is a tipping point where the real estate market collapses, and all of a sudden rich people want to flee Miami, and then the next group people want, and it's just it goes from being this managed things to like the the economy collapses, or just or it's an entropy kind of thing, and that's what I think probably is going to happen with like as you start managed retreat, it becomes unmanageable retreat. Well, so I'm actually really concerned about the unmanaged retreat in exactly that scenario where we have a collapse of the coastal housing market. Cause um, I, I do agree with Jesse Keenan and other analysts who have said, look, coastal property values are going to decline. We just don't know when, and we don't know how quickly they will collapse, but they, they are going to decline. Um, and so if we don't have a government project to help people get out, then what I expect might happen is someone will, who's wealthy will sell their home to someone who's slightly less wealthy at a slightly cheaper price and they'll sell it to someone else and they'll sell it to someone else. And eventually someone will be left holding that hot potato, right? Someone will be left with a house that is effectively unsellable. And what are they going to do? If there's no government program, there's a backstop to help them. They may just have an asset that becomes worth nothing. And I really worry about those people because I think at that point we may have a lot of people who really need that money that they've 
invested in that home. So I think we need a managed strategy, not to kick that ball off, but to be there at the end to help with all the problems that that's going to cause. You open up a whole can of worms in your field there, AR. <laughs> Good luck. I know, there's you, so many. <laughs> no, seriously. And you have to decide like what area of expertise are you really going to drill in on too? You know, it's it's like we I I had wanted to get to some more climate justice issues. We don't have time for that. And that's going to be a future episode because that's a huge part of what you're doing. Um, I do want to take you into just chatting and I got a couple more yeah. questions I'm going to ask you in there, but this has been fantastic. And again, open invitation. We want you back on. I hope this was a good experience for you. Um, but hold on and we're going to go into just chatting and we'll, we'll be right back.